Similarly, the upper life is the realm of sun, moon, and star beings, lightning, thunder, cardinal light, and cloud beings, eagles and bluebirds, bats and big flies, butterflies and dragonflies. This list goes on. All are holy beings. They are unique physical entities and energies, but are also totally interconnected aspects of Skyman, who is, in turn, the embodiment of the spiritual path toward beauty, or Sa'a Nagai. Mountains stand between and unite these interdependent poles of the indivisible unity. Upon them, sky man and earth woman bend toward one another, he down and she up, in order to accomplish intercourse between their physical and spiritual essences. Navajo philosophers indicate that this union bestows rain and dew, which yield uh, white and yellow corn and their respective pollens, the stuff of life. This unity can be sensed within each of us. The venerable chanter Curry Mustache, Curly Mustache, um, observed near the close, of, the close of his long life, that the human body has two sides. The left side of physicality and thought is male. It is the provenance of blue blood, which flows through blue earth veins. The male side is visualized as topped by a tassel of white corn, source of life-bearing pollen, which is associated with the major holy people, white corn boy and corn pollen boy. The right side of our bodies is female, envisioned as the provenance of yellow corn and of its two holy people, yellow corn girl and corn beetle girl. Theirs is the provenance of red blood, which flows through red earth veins. This is the oxygen-rich red-blooded principle that bestows life. The right side is crowned by a tassel of yellow corn. Yellow is the color of womanhood. The female side is associated with the emotional, feelings aspect of our being. Curly Mustache went on to say that these two metaphysiological uh, channels uh, meet together at the center of our body. From the traditional Navajo standpoint, the female side is every bit the same as Earth Woman and the Great Goddess, Changing Woman, both of whom are Bike Hozho. One's left side, similarly, is the essence of ideal manhood, that of the Sun Bearer or the Warrior Twins, and is Sa'a Nagai. As in the macrocosm, so too in the microcosm. As in sky and earth, so too in man and woman. Within each pair, as well as all together, occurs the irreducible uh, pa, uh, pas de deux of unity's dance. But Navajo creation teachings reveal that this was not always so. It happened that in the previous fourth world, men and women voluntarily had separated for a period of four years. Some say that first man and first woman had quarreled. Others tell of sexual infidelities. Whatever the cause, the men and women thought that they could live perfectly well apart from one another. So the, one, the women paddled to the opposite shore of a great river on long rafts made from them by men. The rafts were later used as firewood. At first all went well on both sides of the river. The women grew corn for food. The men hunted. Later, however, the supply of game and the men's hunting skills began to falter. The women's corn crops failed. The men and women began to suffer physically, and even more so, with unsatiated sexual desire. So, uh, so, so severe was their pain that both resorted to satisfying their needs in the most bizarre kind of ways. Naturally, this led to further desires, and in future times, great dangers. After years of separation, the ancient people came back together, but before reuniting sexually, four days of purification rites were required. The outer moral of this crucial story from Navajo history is that man and woman need one another for society to continue. At a deeper level, it counsels the necessity of the union of both the male and female sides of the human body-mind so that emotions can be controlled and peace of mind prevail. Even more profoundly, it reveals that one must not disturb the primordial unity of the male and female principles, the Sa'anagai Bike Hozho. One must not submit to polarized ways of thinking, feeling, and acting, lest one fall out of the synchrony with the pattern of balance with the cosmos. The story of the separation and reunification of the sexes, which every Navajo child learns early on, is nothing less than the model for the transformation of the cosmic disorder of Hoxko into the abiding beauty of Hozho. 
A basic cornerstone of the Tibetan view of reality is quite the same. It is the idea that imbalance between polar energies and thoughts must be reconciled into auspiciousness, tashi, lest, uh, lest psychic and physical disease, tamishi, follow. This concept of harmonizing opposites, of joining heaven and earth, is in fact an ancient understanding throughout all of Inner Asia. We are most familiar with its expression in Taoism, the spiritual movement in China that developed a profound conceptual framework around the idea of an all-abiding, non-referential unity called the Tao. Taoism aside, this wisdom of unity pervades the spiritual and everyday philosophy of all North and East Asians, including Tibet. Two Taoist symbols have served and inspired Tibetans over the millennia. The first, the yin-yang, expresses the inextricable union of non-self-existing oppositional energies. That is to say, whereas polar opposites appear to exist in and of themselves, one cannot exist without the presence of the other. One paisley-shaped section represents the yin while the other is yang, but each has a dot of the other color contained within its form, signifying the interpenetration of one with the other. They are enclosed by a circle symbolizing the total unity of both. Therefore, all things are the composite of both energies and tendencies. The yin-yang is probably humankind's most elegant model of the conciliation of opposites. It is the outer expression of a philosophy that recognizes our reality as one of constant flux, a system in dynamic equilibrium. This system was developed by ancient Taoist masters into a diagnostic tool whose inner code was most uh, closely parallels the natural processes of of heaven and earth. It is known as the I Ching, and from it comes the second set of symbols of sky and earth that figure prominently in the Tibetan unity code. The I Ching is founded upon the constant process of balancing between opposing tendencies. Yin is the passive receptive energy principle. It is associated with the terrestrial imperative, the nurturing, procreative, receptive female earth energy by which all phenomena are birthed and embraced. Yin exists in indivisible but dynamic partnership with her necessary complement, Yang, the celestial imperative consisting of the active male principle of sky-like expansiveness and directed motion toward a goal. They are visualized as the two fundamental uh, trigrams, and which in turn derive from uh, fundamental lines. And these fundamental trigrams, along with the segments of the yin-yang, are considered the two primary aspects of Tai Chi, the great ultimate. It is the ultimate source of energy and mind beyond duality and the goal of the process of unifying dualistic thought and action. These trigrams are used in Tibetan astrology and in even more ancient uh, practices for symbolizing and invoking the powers and sentience of Sa and Nam, earth and sky. For Tibetans, the earth is a material realm full of sentience and power. The cyclic growths and dec decays, the bloomings and witherings, the movements of the earth itself, all are composed of patterned energies. The energy created by the bodily actions, expressive urges, and thoughts of sentient beings inhabiting it. This sentience and power is neither good nor bad, it simply is. Live according to the powers that is in synchrony with them, and they will bring blessings. Not living according to the principles of nature will result in disease in body, speech, and mind. To achieve and maintain this balance, or Tashi, physical offerings accompanied by prayers, heartfelt vocalizations and visualizations, must be given to the full range of earth powers. This totality of earth powers is envisaged by the aboriginal Tibetan mind as an old wrinkled woman wearing golden yellow robes. Old Mother Konma rides upon a ram holding a golden noose in one hand. Her symbol is a ram's skull with the earth trigram painted in ochre on its forehead, which is used in a rite called closing the door of the earth. The male or sky trigram is used similarly in a rite called closing the door of the sky. 
Here it is painted on the skull of a dog and is part of a thread cross array given in offering to the inherent master of the sky, Old Father Kenpo. He is envisioned as a white-haired old man dressed in white with a white wand and riding a white sky dog. The ceremony is aimed at ensuring the blessings of the sky powers that are under the direction of the Old Father. In this regard, he that is his qualities is invoked in a similar manner to his his consort, the old mother of the earth. Through these ancient rituals and energetic aspects of earth and sky, the fundamental powers of female and male are balanced within the reality and body-mind of the individual, knowing the powers of earth and sky. At this point in the comparison of the Tibetan and Navajo ideas of the union of earth and sky, we need to reconsider their pantheons of nature divinities. They are concrete examples of the natural polar energies that move us from within and without, and with which both peoples strive to remain in balance during the course of their lives. First, the powers of the earth, its rocks and waters. The Tibetans' earth's, uh, the Tibetans earth's dark, watery places are inhabited by counterparts to the terrestrial masters of the earth. These Lu manifest in the physical world as snakes, frogs, and scorpions, but their more subtle forms are visualized as serpent-bodied women and men, and like the snake with its split tongue, they are endowed with decidedly split personalities. Such expressions of the energies of the terrestrial cosmos are not concerned with distinctions between good and evil. Rather, they simply respond in a naturally reciprocal relationship to the actions of humans who would pollute their spring, stream, river, or lake, or who would ask improper, uh, improperly for prosperity. As if speaking for Tibetans, the scholar of Navajo religion Gladys Reichard observes the impossibility of the Navajos drawing a sharp line between what we Westerners regard as opposites, good and evil, for example. What harms him will also cure him, and in this sense good and evil are one. A holy being has a power which man lacks. According to the Tibetan understanding, if the Lu are angered slightly, they may withhold valuable wish-fulfilling jewels, signifying a person's good fortune, which they hoard in illumined palaces in the water's depths. Davy Jones' locker is not an inappropriate Western description of the cash reigned over by the king and queen of the Lu. Keeping in psychic and ritual balance with them leads to good fortune. If, however, one falls far out of harmony with the serpentine powers, illness such as skin disease or mental problems, and even death may ensue. Their, da their dank atmosphere of water and earth is a place to which human beings must be eternally attuned, since it is at once essential to life, yet totally alien to human experience. A particularly ancient Tibetan visualization of serpentine water energy is Chusin Gyalmo, Queen of the Water Sin. Sin is a class of environmental power beings from the Bon religion. Chusin embodies the raw power of the waters. Uh, her snout is serpentine, her horns are like sharp coral branches or dragon's horns, her teeth are sharp, and she is fiercely protective of her realm. One account likens her to a crocodile, another to a porpoise. Imprecise associations aside, she is considered a relatively benevolent but supremely powerful water being. By polluting a stream or lake or, falling to, or failing to give offerings at a place inhabited by such sin or lu energy, one is left open to contra uh, contracting an illness. The manifests, uh, this manifests most commonly as a skin infection such as boils, with leprosy being the ultimate fate. Thus, ceremonies for restoring an individual's or a family's balance with the Lu are particularly commonplace. Likewise, offerings of food, butter, prayer flags, and kata scarves at springs, and even water taps are made, especially at the advent of the new year. Throughout Tibet, along riverbanks and in swampy areas, one finds prayer flag-bedecked rocky shrines to these powers of the waters. The Navajo, too, recognize water beings as potential sources of illness and misfortune. It is believed that fish and other aquatic life are sources of skin illness. 
This has resulted in a traditional injunction against eating fish, although it has broken down in recent decades. Interestingly, Tibetans also do not eat fish. For them, fish are at once associated with the reality of the Lu, and are, in case of the mythic golden-eyed fish, auspicious beings. The Navajo's healthy, uh, healthy regard for the water powers stems from an incident during the emergence by the ancient people into this fifth world reality. The teachings, see chapter 2, relate that during the period of the separation of the sexes, two separate young women attempted to swim across the river in order to join the men on the other bank. But midstream they were captured and dragged under by Tihultsodi, the water monster envisioned as a horned water creature. One uh, nightway chanter explains that on searching for the missing women, talking God and calling God gained safe entry via their mysterious powers into the home of the great buffalo-shaped water monster. They had been uh, followed by Coyote, the Navajo trickster, who is clever and powerful. The histories relate, The rescue party entered the illuminated central room of the water monster's four-chambered house to be greeted by the chief, other versions say the chiefess of the earth's waters. He asked them their business, and talking God replied that they came for their grandchildren. Here are the women, now leave quickly, answered Tehultsodii. Uh, neither of the holy people knew at the time that Coyote had abducted two of the water monster's babies, secreting them under his long coat, and when the loss was discovered, the water monster killed or imprisoned many of the ancient people, and more seriously still sent a massive wall of floodwaters from the four directions to submerge the entire world and all in it. Luckily, the people were able to escape the gathering waters. Uh, they grew a giant reed that extended up through a hole in the sky in, which it, uh, in what was the rocky floor of the fifth world. Just as they emerged into the fifth world, the waters began spilling forth from the hole. It created a major flood that caused the formation of the San Juan, Colorado, Salt, and Jemez rivers, in addition to a permanent lake at the place of emergence. Only then did the ancient people discover the water monster's babies with coyote. Realizing their connection with the flood, they placed the babies in a basket made of white shell, the Navajo Master Jewel. It was placed with a prayer and a sincere apology onto the waters issuing out of the emergent hole, and the flow of water immediately ceased. As in the earthly lower life, water figures prominently in spiritscape of the opposite pole of the Navajo cosmos, the upper life or sky realm. Water is the primarily material link, uh, linking sky and earth in the form of rain, the generative nectar by which sky and earth principles create life. No wonder that the sky's water energy has been vividly symbolized by both cultures. The Navajo describe great thunder beings in their chants and prayers. They are part humanoid and part big bird, eagle, having wind, rain, and lightning at the ends of their wings. Note the prayer from the nightway ceremony to the thunderer who is dark cloud, signifying the fertility of the rain, beginning on page 209 of part 4. The thunderers are celestial water powers bristling with the kinetic energy of the thunderstorm. They exist to the four directions, as do all important Navajo divinities. In the Shooting Way teachings, they join the water ox and the water horse as the primary powers of both watery realms. In the Navajo Beadway lineage of transformative wisdom and practice, there is a sand painting showing four feathered snakes. It depicts them aiding a human hero whose spiritual biography forms the basis of the Beadway myth, who ascend into the sky, the eagle's realm. The black and blue skins of the snakes are marked with lightning and their bodies are shaped like lightning. In fact, it is not surprising to learn that snakes and lightning are quite interchangeable in Navajo thought. Similarly, Tibetans know that thunderclouds are the external dressing of indwelling energy beings called druk, thunder dragons. Their serpentine forms bristle lightning-like with spines, scales, horns, and claws. Their flickering tongues are the lightning, their voices the thunder. They are empowered by one or more norbu, 
wish-fulfilling jewels that are hoarded by their cousins, the Lu. Should they drop their tightly clenched jewel, they would shrivel up and fall from the sky. Paralleling the flying snakedness of the dragon is the mythic giant eagle, Cha Kyung, known as Garuda in India. It holds a snake, signifying the earthly Lu in its mouth. The Cha Kyung is, in turn, the mount upon which the Bodhisattva thunderbolt bearer rides as he hurls thunderbolts upon his enemies. In these paired animal symbols comes the message of the inextricable unity of earth and sky, and the place of conscious beings in between. Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche called the imminent architecture of heaven and earth the natural hierarchy of the sacred world. His system follows a tripartite scheme that is similar to the upper and lower lives of the Navajo, except that while the place of humans and other earth surface beings in the scheme is implied by the Navajo, it is specified by the Tibetans. Natural order in the sacred world. Trungpa Rinpoche observed that a proper relationship between heaven and earth with rain as their linkage makes things pliable and the earth fertile. In fact, he taught that combining the creative freedom of sky and the nurturing power of the earth is the basis of a good human society which operates in between. This natural order is symbolized by three aboriginal Tibetan power beings and their, bot their abodes. First, in order of appearance, are the Lu, the wealth-bestowing energies of the murky lowlands, and their mates, the Sadag, earth masters of the drier tracks spreading below the mountains. Lu signify in the natural hierarchy the rich possibilities of living. The Nyan, aboriginal protector deities, embody the mountain slopes. They are the principle of gentle solidness and are a metaphor for humanity. We who walk the sacred path of life with heads in the sky and feet on the earth, the La, including country gods and tantric divinities, live in palatial dwellings of light atop their sacred mountains, much as do the holy people of the Navajo. They signify in their height and guiding inner light the highest level of wakefulness. Translating the Lu Nyan La, paradigm into daily life, Trungpa Rinpoche cautions that one's daily habits should follow this natural order. Feet belong on the ground, not on tabletops. Crowns of heads are sacred places, the highest point in the flow of consciousness, and should be treated with respect, i.e. never touched. One's head and neck are La, one's trunk is Nyan, and one's legs and feet are Lu. Thus one's body and its activities necessarily must be harmonized with the energy of these three natural levels of the cosmos at large. Such attention to the natural order and balancing of polarity is also crucially important to the Navajo. Washington Matthews called this understanding the law of butts and tips. As an example, many Navajo ceremonies require wooden offering objects to the deities known as Kita'an. They are made from carved tree branches and twigs. Navajos assign the growing end of the twig to the head of the Kita'an, which often has eyes and a mouth painted on it. The wider bottom end, or butt, must never be used for the head of the offering object. I remember accompanying an old Navajo gentleman on a branch cutting expedition during a nightway ceremony. We had to find a half yard long straight branch, about one inch thick, that was growing eastwardly out of a pinion on juniper tree trunk. This would be the cane used by the Gaskidi, the mountain sheep tutelary deity, who bears a pack of dark cloud on his back containing seeds of plenty, signifying sky and earth combined. He had, uh, we had to be careful to remember to mark the butt and tip ends, for it would be harmful to this ceremony of psychophysical healing if the masked Ye's staff, upon which he leans as he hobbles into the ceremonial hogan, were to touch the ground with the wrong end. Worse indeed, that feet on the table, even the uh, logs and the walls of the hogan must begin with their butt ends in the direction of the eastern wall and their tips pointing in a clockwise, sunwise direction from butt to tip. Consequently, when a Navajo makes a self-offering using corn pollen, a pinch of this essence of life is placed on, is placed on the tongue, speech, then on the crown of the head, mind, next in a sweep, uh, sweeping motion, it is 
scattered first to the Hogan's earthen floor, then upward to the sky. The symbolism is clear. First it is used to empower and purify the person's own earthen sky. Then it is offered to the cosmos's earthen sky in the proper manner. The lower life, then the upper life, but to tip the natural order. For Navajos and Tibetans, the dialogue between earth and sky recognizes not the separate nature of the two aspects of the natural order, but their inseparable abiding union. Indeed, both cultures have very specific names and teachings concerning the inherent unity of opposite energies and qualities. In this light, we can appreciate the most fundamental means of the episode in Navajo history dealing with the separation of the sexes. They relate that the first men's and women's uh, aberrant thoughts and masturbatory actions resulted in the conception and birth of terrifying superhuman monsters that plague the Navajo people. As such, it is a lesson in avoiding primal apartheid between complementary energies and modes of acting, expressing, and thinking. It depicts the dangerous effects of separating one's Sa'anagai, male side, from the Bikehozho, female part of one's being. It is a sure path to mental and physical disorder. Its ultimate message is not to deny the existence of these polarities within oneself, but rather to work with them. A more immediate lesson drawn from the separation of the sexes is a cautionary one relating to daily life. It suggests that by living in a polarized fashion, one can create harm to self, family, and clan. In this extreme form, such personification is known as witchcraft, and the perpetrator is called a Navajo wolf or skinwalker, after the witch's supposed wearing of animal skins during acts of mayhem. For Tibetans, such extremist behavior is associated with black or left-handed anti-sunwise magic. Emphasis on self-gratification by a Navajo is evidence enough of being on the path of disorder, uh, hoxho, the, uh, to regain and maintain a state of balance or order, hozho, one must develop reasonableness, uh, Alfred W. Yazzie. Otherwise, one must be ritually restored into beauty, an expensive, difficult, and dangerous uh, psychophysical procedure, but another way when the sexes be they physical or put another way, when the sexes, be they physical states or states of mind, become separated within or without, disease or disorder of the most pernicious type necessarily arises, and one loses one's rightful place between sky and earth. Primordial Pairs the model of the two-in-one balance between opposite energies and qualities is called Alki. Alki'i Na'ashi in Navajo, which translates literally as the ones who follow one another, or more simply, follower pairs. The name signifies the unity of complementary qualities and energies personified as paired holy people. According to this scheme, the nurturing and supportive calling God follows and complements the thoughtful and powerful leadership of talking God. Primordial pairing is vividly illustrated in the Navajo wedding ceremony. The chanter or elder who officiates over the ceremony spreads corn pollen on a specially prepared wedding basket containing cornmeal batter. He first sprinkles a line of corn, uh, a line of pollen, the seed of the seed of life, from east to west. This is the access of talking God and calling God, and signifies the principle of maleness in its active and passive guises. A pollen line is then made from south to north, likewise signifying the female access. According to the Blessing Way teachings that are at the foundation of this ceremony, their intersection is the place where life arises. The male axis includes the energetic dawning and dusking movement of the sun and those parallel qualities of body-mind within each of us, while the female axis marks the sun's full presence and its utter absence, the absolute dual nature of phenomena. The former is Sa'anagai, the heroic process of living into ripe old age through repeated spiritual renewal so as to attain the everlasting life of the female principle, Bikehozo. Bikehozo is both the the energy of giving life, like the full power of the noonday, southern sun, and dark moon-like power over life and death. Maintaining this natural unity of polarities is a fundamental meaning behind Sa'anagai, Bikehozho, and the basis of Dine Be'ina, the Navajo way of life.
Sa'anagai and Bikehozho signify the union of the lower and upper lives as embodied by Earth Woman and Sky Man. The mother, Earth Woman, and the father, Sky Man, are envisioned in sand painted figures. The sun, moon, and stars abide inside the body of Sky Man, who is Sa'anagai, while the four cultivated plants, corn, beans, squash, and tobacco, sprout at the navel of Earth Woman, who is Bikehozho. Their horns indicate their extreme power, while the four colored stripes on their faces indicate the four directions, winds, elements, and prior world realities. Their mouths are connected by a stream of corn pollen. Corn pollen symbolizes the spark and seed of sentience, and since speech is for the Navajo, as it is for the Tibetans, one of the major aspects of one's totality, these holy people are said to speak the pollen words of Sa'anagai and Bikehozho. Sky man and earth woman are an exquisite symbolic expression of Alki'i Na'ashi. They embody the essence not only of sky and earth, but also of infinite and finite, the universe and you. They embody what Tibetan tantric practitioners call zinpa, meaning conjoined and conjugal. Another way of expressing this state of conjoined male and female principles is yab yum, or father mother. Both terms refer to the visualized and artistic rendered image of sexually united male and female aspects of a single tutelary deity. This sporting or enjoyment pose is a basic model for tantric deities. Tantric Buddhas and Bodhisattvas are mentally generated embodiments of the various natural energies of the outer and inner cosmos. Being fully at one with the void's process of emptiness, or beauty as the Navajo call it, the Yidam tutelaries are, by definition, complete, whole, holy. They are seen as the unity of complementary energies and tendencies of heaven and earth that all humans, and other sentient beings still in samsara, inherently possess but consistently mm -hmm ignore or abuse. So in this sense the sexual act is much more than mere physicality. It signifies the plane of the spirit made flesh and the flesh made spirit, and the yabyum is the most immediately compelling and attention attracting symbol of the two in one state of being. In the tantric tradition, the ultimate physical symbol of this unity of opposites is the image of the primordial Adi Buddha. External trappings aside, it holds very much the same significance as the pairing of the Navajo Sky Man with Earth Woman and Sa'a Nagai Boy with Bikehozho Girl. The identity of the Adi Buddha varies according to the school of tantric Buddhism, and indications are that its seed form existed even prior to the advent of Buddhism in Tibet. The earlier Bon religion had a divinity who, like the primordial Buddha, was not a creator divinity but an ultimate unity figure. After Buddhism arrived with Padmasambhava, the Bon primordial deity Shenla Okar, the divine shaman of white light, together with Chu Sin Gyalmo, the water sin queen, likely evolved into the primordial Buddha pair of the Nyingma, the old school of Tibetan Buddhism. There is to be known as uh, these uh, there to be known as Kunt Zuzangpo Mo, the all good man woman. The all good man and all good woman are visualized, painted, and sculpted as lapis blue and crystalline white human forms, respectively in sexual embrace. They are naked and in a total state of oneness, which is the nature of the void. They also signify the union of polar energies within one's psychic nervous system, the flow of subtle winds and consciousness principles through the left and right male and female channels and into the central channel. There the vibratory energies of life and awareness unite and distill into drops of purified body-mind. Other lineages of Tibetan Tantra recognize different emblems of the primordial pair. Primarily, uh, primary among these are the holder of the thunderbolt scepter, Dorje Chang, Vajradhara, who is indivisibly united with the mother of wisdom, Sharab Parchin, Prajnaparamita. Usually one encounters only the male figure holding a thunderbolt scepter and bell with crossed arms. 
These tools symbolize, respectively, the male-like, methodical but compassionate journey toward the blissful union with the wisdom and energy of the cosmos, the female principle. The bell, whose open sound symbolizes the state of pure awareness of the nature of things, is thus matched with the symbol of exceedingly powerful psychophysical action, the thunderbolt scepter. These alone are sufficient to convey the primordial union idea without the two deity forms being present. Out of Tibetan and Navajo primordial pairs issue all the fractional pairs, making up both traditions, rich pantheons, and tutelary divinities and other empowered beings. Navajos and Tibetans populate their cosmos with complementary pairs of divine beings that embody the spectrum of energies and tendencies of cosmos and body-mind. These are called Yei by the Navajo and Yidam by the Tibetans. Yeis are stylized imaginings, convenient quanta of inner wind souls of a multitude of phenomena. These various rainbow-colored winds and elemental aspects of mind become the soul, the life, breath, and thought of their host forms. And since the raw energies and tendencies of the cosmos exist simultaneously within each of us, we and the Yeis are in fact one. Because the Yeis represent our inner powers, if one falls out of balance with beauty, they must be called upon ritually to rebalance the disordered body-mind. During the great winter healing rite, the night way, the full range of male and female Yeis under the tutelage of talking god make their appearance. Through them, stubborn disorders of the mind and nervous system are treated, and initiated Navajos are introduced uh, and uninitiated Navajos are introduced into the mysteries of the tutelary divinities. The Yidams and the Tibetans are similarly, uh, the Yidams of the Tibetans are similarly pure, rainbow-tinted visualizations of ideal beings. They are basically humanoid in shape and possess the purified and enlightened qualities of body-mind nascent in all sentient beings. Each Yidam tutelary is a fully enlightened being, a Buddha, but emphasizes in its body, speech, and mind a particular kind of enlightened wisdom energy. In the Tibetan system, a yidam is chosen for a person by a lama, based on the recipient's profile of psychic and karmic tendencies. The yidam becomes a lifelong model or guide in transforming the person into the ideal version of him or herself. Significantly, in both systems, the tutelaries are generally paired off. This convenient metaphor of union signifies the necessary balancing of complementary energies and, quali and qualities of body-mind. Knowing this, let's meet some of the more important binary units of holiness of the Tibetans and Navajos. We recall that, according to the Tantric Buddhist creation paradigm, this fourth world reality was created by the Bodhisattva Boundless Love, Chenrezig, Avalokiteshvara, an emanation of the Western Sun Buddha, Boundless Light, Opame Amitava. Boundless love oversees and enriches our world reality. He is joined in his paradise of Potala by the great goddess Dolma Tara in her white aspect. We are told that Dolma was born from a tear in Chenrezig's eye on seeing the suffering of sentient beings. Paired emanations such as these are extremely numerous, making the Tibetan pantheon seem, at first, bewilderingly complex. But knowing that all these emanations arise as are needed out of the abiding oneness, the emptiness of the void, is crucial to understanding how the pantheon system operates. Boundless love and the mother goddess Tara take numerous forms. The creation legend of the central Tibetans tells of a monkey living high in a cave atop Mount Kong Kongpori, a sacred peak in the Yarlung Valley. In an adjacent cave lived a fierce divinity of the rocky ridges. Out of their unusual marital union came wild red-faced children, the first Tibetans. Tibetans believe their monkey father to have been an emanation of Chen Rezi and their fierce rock goddess mother to be Tara. In a similar scenario, after the Navajo great goddess Changing Woman was born from the union of Sa'a Nagai and Bike Hozho, Sky and Earth, she rapidly matured. 
On attaining puberty, she was impregnated by a ray of the sun and by a stream from a waterfall. According to the eminent early 20th century chanter Sandoval, she was in fact impregnated by Sunbearer and his complementary reflex form, Water Sprinkler. She rapidly gave birth to the warrior twins and later created the Navajos themselves. Since then, Sunbearer and Changing Woman have lived in their glorious jeweled island in the sunset realm of the Pacific Ocean. Another fundamental primordial deity, uh, deity pair is found in the divine architecture of Tantra. The diamond being of the East is paired with his Western complement, the Buddha of Boundless Life, Sepame Amitayus. Boundless Life's body re radiates the orange-red glow of sunset as he holds in his lap a vase containing the nectar of longevity for his life and of the immortality of Buddhahood. Tibetans invoke boundless life's nurturing, indrawing energy by means of a right geared toward assuring long life called Sewang, the life empowerment. The presiding Lama calls upon boundless life to empower with life-maintaining energy special spheroid pills composed of samba, barley meal, and sugar, along with vases of sanctified water and chang, grain beer. The power is transferred into these sacraments which are then imbibed. Eating the pills transmits the deity's life-giving powers to one's psychic nervous system's energy node, chakra, situated at the heart area. After the liquids are tasted, the last drops are wiped on the crown of the head, another chakra, as a consecration of the La, one's life force. Consider the parallel self-blessing procedure using corn, pollen, during Navajo daily and healing ceremonies. The deep teachings of Tantra recognize boundless life as the pure awareness and blazing self-light of knowledge, and his vase is told to contain the body's mixed and consecrated regenerative fluids, which have at their basis the male and female winds or bodhicittas. It is also called the nectar of immortality. Through the powers of their imaginations and the sacramental offerings, Tibetans imbibe the nectar, which then pervades their body minds with the greatest bliss deriving from sense the clear light of purified awareness. This done, boundless life stream complement, the diamond being is invoked by means of a sacred rock crystal, the color of his body and the clear light of mind. The invocation asks that the celestial knowledge, the manifestation of the two-in-one, be finally realized. In this way, the right sanctified pills, water, and beer may be considered the source of the mind, speech, and body of the unity of the diamond being and boundless life. Paired powers of East and West, dawn and sunset, play a major role in Navajo philosophy and ritual. Calling God is the essence of the West and of sunset. He is sometimes called Harvest God, revealing this Navajo tutelary's life-supporting and abundance-producing nature. Calling God is the complement of Talking God. While they may be seen to act separately in myth and ritual, they are in fact a single entity. Calling God is the follower of Talking God, insofar as Talking God is the initiator and Calling God the supporter. Calling God's body is yellow. The Navajo consider this the color of sunset and of the Western realm. Yellow is the female complementary color to the white of maleness. It is also the color of corn pollen, the sacrament that is every bit as empowering to the Navajo's body mind as the nectar of spiritual immortality is to the Tibetans. Both pairs compose the East-West axis in their respective ideal realities. East-West is the union of initiatory, activating energy with that of reflective and nurturing power. These are important markers both in the movement of the daily cycle and in the lifetimes of human beings. The south-north axis is the Navajo mandala. Uh, in the Navajo mandala, symbolizes the solar day and lunar night, with their respective powers of enrichment and protection. In the Nightway lineage, the south is the realm of the nurturing water sprinkler god, an aspect of the sun bearer, while the north is the place of cold starfire, managed by the all-powerful black god. 
The North is also associated in another Chantway lineages with Moonbearer, the more enigmatic and dangerous associate of Sunbearer. Conceptualizing paired polar energies is central to the process of psycho-spiritual transformation. It describes a reality of pure, holy, enlightened energies of body and mind in balance. The deep experience of such a state of equilibrium brings the powers of the tutelaries to bear within one's own body-mind and effects a cure, a restoration of harmony, purity, enlightenment, beauty, and holiness. This primordial union is visualized by Tibetans and Navajos as a partnership of earth and sky, female and male qualities, supportive and active energies. Because both deities are such important models for the spiritual way of life, Navajos and Tibetans envision them both together and individually. They are the cosmic mother and the spiritual hero, universal personas that underlie all human spirituality. The Cosmic Mother Everything you can think of, everything you can see, is a production of the goddess, Joseph Campbell. Tibetans and Navajos live in constant awareness of the dance of the goddess through all things. The universal female principle is the groundwork of our daily lives. She is reality's eternal underpinning. She is beauty and the void. Unfortunately, many Westerners and industrialized Easterners no longer seem to understand this abiding truth. During the past half a millennium, the West philosophy of life and spirit has effectively excluded the goddess from her natural partnership with the male principle. Our uh, aberrant patriarchal interpretation of Judeo-Christian Islamic doctrine has almost fully succeeded in dismembering Inanna, the ancient Near Eastern great goddess, and her earliest form, the Paleolithic Venus. Only a few heavily suppressed remnants of the goddess survived in the West. They include Tara of the Celtic world, Fatima in the Mediterranean, Mary in Northern Europe and in Mexico, the Aztec goddess of the moon, Tonantzin, known in her new guise as the Virgin of Guadalupe. What is it to be, mother? Naturally, I, as a man, cannot begin to imagine the physical and mental experience of giving birth, unless the birthing of ideas in books, less physical but still highly exhausting, would qualify in this regard. Yet I can distill from my thoughts and life experiences two aspects of motherhood slash womanhood that appear to be universal. The first aspect of the cosmic mother may be called the mother of nurture. She is the body-mind who birthed you, the nurturer and protector who set you on life's path, and your mentor in the processes and pitfalls of living. Her complementary self may be called the mother of energy. She is the underlying vital force connecting the mother's body-mind with that of the child. She is the loving, soothing words that pacify bewilderment and fear. She is the impulse that showers the child with psychic and physical gifts. She is the willpower that entices and cajoles the child into happiness, and when necessary, punishes with great wrath. The mother of energy is her child's first peacemaker, benefactor, lover, and disciplinarian. She is at times the dawn, sunshine, dusk, and darkest night, depending on the quality of energy required at any given time. When these energies are properly expressed, they guide the child into a proper relationship with the world and toward becoming the best version of him or herself. Nurture and energy are complementary aspects of the totality the Tibetans call Gyalyum, the Great Mother. Her most recognizable emanation is that of Dolma, whose name means she who releases from suffering. To the Navajo, she is Astsa'a Nadle'ehe, she who rejuvenates herself time and again, or changing woman. The renowned Tibetan teacher Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche once observed that the cosmic mother is ultimately neither she nor he, but a principle of cosmic structure, the all-accommodating basic ground. She is often called womb of the dharmas, the originator of all existences. In this sense she is beyond motherhood. She is neither mother nor father, but simultaneously both polarities combined, since she becomes before the two. Uh, since she comes before the two, she is the, necess uh, she is the necessary a priori ideal caused for the existence of all relative life and consciousness in our real world. Mother of Nurture The Navajo call the totality of the nurturing mother Shima, my mother. 
There are actually many names for her depending on the qualities being considered. We have already encountered her as Changing Woman, but she is also known by other names. She is, for one, the principle of Mother Earth in the divine guise of Earth Woman. Through the partnership of myth and the fertile Navajo imagination, she is seen to be dressed in the earth in its four jewels or terrestrial features, soil, trees, water, and corn. She is the Shima of the Navajo themselves. After molding the first four pairs of Navajo men and women from balls of epidermal skin rubbed from various locations on her body, she instilled in them the breath of life and thought. She placed within each of them installing human-shaped wind souls. According to the Blessing Way teachings, these beings became the progenitors of the four original clans of the people. From her miraculous birth out of the union of the wind souls of Sky Man and Earth Woman through her first menstruation and up to the present pregnancy, culminating in the birth of the warrior twins, Changing Woman is universally known as White Shell or Bead Woman. She was so named at dawn on her tenth day of life. The dawn is the time of white light and is white shell energy. It is the quarter of the day during which all things arise and begin their growth uh, toward maturity. Like the dawning of a new day, like the first growth in the life cycles of female animals and plants, like white shell changing woman, all human females experience the spurt of fecundity with the arrival of adolescence and sexual maturity. It is such a momentous event in a woman's life cycle that the Navajo signal the past into womanhood with the coming of age rite known as Kina Alda, a branch of the Blessing Way. Its rituals and, mystic nar and mythic narrative recount the Kina Alda of White Shell Woman and the girl from whom this rite is held and the girl for whom this rite is held is made holy with the same characteristics of mind, voice, and body possessed by White Shell Woman at the onset of her womanhood. The four-day initiation into the path of womanhood is carefully programmed to plant the seeds of womanhood in the girl and to begin her transformation into a healthy and balanced woman. The initiate is adorned with the finest clothes and jewelry as befitting White Shell Woman, whom she will soon become. She is instructed in the values and responsibilities of womanhood. She is molded and stretched via massage by a wise old woman so as to give her a strong and healthy body. She begins her first of many daily races toward the sun, by which she becomes increasingly empowered with the energy of the holy people. And she begins a regimen of, a regimen of strenuous corn grinding that will culminate on the fourth day of the rite in a ritual cake pit baked in the ground whose center will be offered to earth woman and the periphery to all assembled at the ceremony. She stays up all night on the third evening and fourth morning of the rite to participate in the no sleep ceremony led by a blessing way chanter. The songs and prayers bless the initiate, the hogan, various valuable possessions gathered in ceremonial baskets, and all the participants assembled there. After the highly sacred dawn songs are sung and prayers made, she races for the last time toward the dawn. At the final morning's feast of the ceremonial cake, her body is ritually molded for the last time. She is now holy and will be so for a further four-day period. During this time, she may give blessings to any person, animal, or object that may require them. She is White Shell, Changing Woman. Through the prayers, songs, and instructions given at her Kina Alda, she takes on the qualities of White Shell Woman and naturally becomes holy as an embodiment of the great goddess Changing Woman, Mother of the People. The girl is now woman in her perfectly formed, childbearing state. She is on the cusp of the first movement in her cycle of life. She may now fully and confidently become the nurturer and guide for her future children, since she is empowered with the qualities of body, voice, and mind of White Shell Woman. Once she begins to bear children and manifest her full womanhood, she will become a changing woman, she who rejuvenates herself time and again, as she does through the seasons of her life. White Shell Woman is so much a part of Changing Woman's persona that the Navajos often confuse their relationship. Some say that they are different names for the same goddess. Others say that they are twins. Others say, uh, others say that since White Shell is the name for any grouping of jewels, they stand for the four directional jewels, White Shell, Turquoise, Abalone, and Jet, which in turn stand for the four aspects of Changing Woman. All are correct. 
Tibetans celebrate the white Tara, Dolkar, as the youthful, fertile aspect of the totality that is the cosmic mother. She is lithe, beautiful, fecund. She is composed of transparent, white, clear light, which is none other than the light of pure awareness. She is the special embodiment of compassion and longevity. Her peaceful demeanor and hand gesture bestowing succor convey this quality of body, speech, and mind. In her emanative relationship with boundless love, she is the essence of nurture. She is mother love. As such, Dolkar is invoked for the blessings of a long life. Sentient beings are watched over and inspired by this energetic but placid young woman who is yet beyond puberty and pregnant with motherly compassion and enlightened knowledge. White Tara looks out at every being as her child from a vantage point within the child when she is visualized by an initiate in her or his daily spiritual practice. Her name, Dolkar, is one of the most common Tibetan women's names. Indeed, an unspoken understanding among Tibetan women is their ambition to become like their mother goddess. White Tara has seven eyes on her body, two in the soles of her feet, two in her palms, and one in her forehead, in addition to the conventional two, making her a potent symbol of total watchfulness toward all life. Mother of Energy the energetic component of cosmic motherhood is embodied in mature visions of the goddess by Tibetans and Navajos. There is a model of visualization among Nyingma Buddhist practitioners by which the great guru Rinpoche, Padmasambhava, was initiated into the goddess's mysteries by a form of Tara. The energy that coursed through Guru Rinpoche's psychic channels, empowering his awareness to generate the vision of Tara, was the energy of subtle wind, Lung. The various subtle energies are visualized in human form as female deities known as kan, uh, Kandoma, Dakini in Sanskrit, or ether goers. In the potent path of Tantra, the energy aspect of the great goddess is often likened to a red-bodied, semi-naked young woman showing a rather fierce grimace as she dances invitingly uh, on one leg. She is the Thunderbolt Sao, Dorje Fogmo, Vajra Varahi. She embodies the totality of the uh, psychophysical energy within each of us, that which must be purified and redirected towards psychic growth. Sultram Alione tells us in Women of Wisdom that visualizing her activities, internal energies which dissolve the sense of outer and inner and plug into a sense of all-pervading energized space which is primordial wisdom and a kind of burning transcendental lust and bliss. Indeed, the Dakini ether-goer is both one's envisioned spiritual guide and those energies of body-mind that must be harnessed and purified for the mind of enlightenment to arise. The ether-goer's personas reflect various qualities of mind and behavior that are present in all human beings. Sometimes they are pacific, smoothing away mental agitation. At other times they enrich the practitioner through their nurturing urges. Sometimes they are utterly attractive and magnetic. But they may also be terrifyingly fierce and destructive of obstacles to illumination. As in the energy of nature, so too in the psyche. Understandably, each form of ether-goer is associated with a cardinal direction, a primal element, and a pure expression of the Buddha mind's wisdom energy. To appreciate how essential the ether-goer Dakini energy principle is to the spiritual practices of the Tibetans, we need to consider several groups of these mothers of energy. One scheme envisions 21 emanations of great goddess energy, with their emblems in the form of the beautiful, glowing, green, 16-year-old goddess known as the Green Tara, Doljang. Her face and posture are alive with vivacious energy. Her eyes sparkle, her right leg extends outward, showing that she is ever ready to come forth and aid all sentient beings. Her hands are in the mudra gesture of bestowing kindness and wisdom. Green Tara figures in a second wisdom energy scheme Green Tara figures in a second wisdom energy scheme. Her dark green color suggests the northern realm of the transcendent tantric Buddha's mandala, and see, she is associated with the all in, uh, accomplishing enlightened actions that the color signifies. She is, in fact, the consort of the tantric Buddha of the north, the all accomplishing one. 
Her greenness suggests a fertile field of energy having a hint of darker victorious powers in service of the path of light. In the mandala of the five transcendent tantric Buddhas, five major forms of the goddess are found, each possessing a different persona, energy, color, and set of bodily attributes. They are the energetic impulses to the enlightened wisdoms embodied by the five transcendent Buddhas. The most potent mother of energy symbols are four, sometimes five, ether goers, depicted as dancing aspects of the thunderbolt sow. In one visualization, she is imagined radiating red light in the center of a mandala at whose cardinal points dance four others of her type. They are the white ether goer of pacifying energy in the east, the yellow dakini of enriching energies in the south, the red mother who magnetizes and subdues obstacles in the west, and the dark green or or blue-black ether-goer, holding forth with fierce energy in the north. In totality, the Thunderbolt Sow is a lascivious, potent enticer of egos and a spiritual guide to yoginis. She is, in fact, the ideal elemental energy for attracting and transforming one's desire-oriented body-mind into that of a Buddha. Once her qualities are harnessed, they provide the necessary elemental impulse to burst forth from the darkness of ignorance into the light that is already there, though hidden within. No wonder then that the Thunderbolt Sow is envisioned to be none other than the consort, the wisdom energy basis of great tantric tutelaries such as the Diamond Being or Demchok Samvara, whose name means Great Bliss. The Thunderbolt Sow and Great Bliss hold forth from the summit of Tibetan's sacred mountain, Kang Rinpoche, and together signalize the harnessing of the enlightening powers of blissful compassion and enlightened wisdom energy. The Red Ether Goer, although possessing powerful energy, is potentially engageable in this reality through properly guided exercise of the body, speech, and mind by a trained Tantric practitioner. Nowhere in the P Tibetan Tantric tradition is the power of the Red Dakini more evident than in the rite called Choa, which, uh, which seeks which seeks the destruction of the ego's hold on the clear light mind. The great explorer practitioner Alexandra David Neal uh, called uh, Chod a terrifying mystery played by one actor. The actor is a yogin or yogini in Sanskrit, uh, Nalajorpa or Nalajorma in Tibetan, who conjures up through the powers of the mind the vital presence of the thunderbolt sow and a host of the most terrifying ghosts and demons imaginable. In the self-exorcism of Chod, the ego is slain and the spirit reborn through a vivacious dialogue between the yogin or yogini and his or her personal demons. These demons are one's mental and emotional defilements, barnacles on the mirror of one's crystalline consciousness that are externalized in the rites visualizations so as to be more easily dispatched by the thunderbolt sow, the rites inner mistress of ceremonies. As a red dancing dakini, symbolizing the subdued and magnetizing energy of one's body-mind, the Thunderbolt Sow is the agent of this powerful transformation. But as in medical healing, where the more potent the medicine, the more effective and swift the cure, there are potentially dangerous side effects to this practice. The body-mind energy that is generated when the yogin does the dance with the Thunderbolt Sow is a force not to be reckoned with lightly. Yet the Thunderbolt Sow is every bit an agent of nurture and benevolence as she is of energy. While she severs delusions, she is also the same mind energy stream as the White Tara. Navajos have their forms of the mother of energy in Changing Woman. She is the mother of nurture in her guise as White Shell Woman, and in her four cyclic forms combined, she is the great mother of energy. Like the White Tara, White Shell Woman is the aspect of Changing Woman, dedicating to creating life and nurture. According to the Navajo follower pair system, her more active aspect is sometimes attributed to the goddess who is turquoise, another way of describing changing woman in her role as the mother of energy. Like the green Tara, the turquoise woman persona of changing woman signifies the mature power of woman both as mother uh, nature. 
Like the tantric ether goers, Changing Woman is the emblem of the four natural energies available to us in the greater cosmos and from within our own body minds. She moves around the circle of life and spirit as do the quarters of the day, the seasons of the year, and the phases of our lives. As the peacefulness and potential of the white dawn and the growth into puberty from infancy, she is the white shell woman. As the full empowerment of the noonday stun, sun spreading its rays of growth throughout the blue midday sky, she is turquoise woman in the full bloom and summertime of womanhood. As the maturity of twilight, the autumnal quality of full matronhood, which draws to herself and her health the family and life's bounty, she is abalone shell woman. And as the venerable elder who in the wintry nighttime of her life sits on her haunches and weathers the dangerous cold within an inner warmth, she is known as Black Jet Woman. As their totality, Changing Woman is able to spring back into life to rejuvenate herself time and again. At the completion of the season's rounds, Black Jet Woman instantly returns as White Shell Woman. Changing Woman is the four in one. Uh, her personas are all aspects of the Mother of Energy principle. Like Tara, Mother of the Buddhas and co-steward of this world reality with boundless love, Changing Woman is Mother of the Twin Warrior Gods and of the Navajo people and co-steward of this world reality with Sunbearer. In both cultures, the Great Goddess signifies the basic groundwork of the cosmos. For the Tibetans, she is the embodiment of ideal reality, the void that is empty of all conventional forms but full of all potential, and its state of auspiciousness, Tashi. Thus she is the generic female aspect of the primordial Buddha pair. For the Navajo, the goddess is at her base as the universal principle of beauty, the imminent order and unity of the cosmos, toward which all traditional Navajos strive in their daily thoughts, expressions, and actions. She is in this way the female aspect of the primordial union of the Navajo. The Spiritual Hero if one advances confidently in the direction of his dreams and endeavors to live the life which he has imagined, he will meet with a success unexpected in common hours. Henry David Thoreau If the Cosmic Mother is the ideal state of being, the goal of the spiritual path, then how do we deal with the not-so-perfect reality in which we all find ourselves? How can we rediscover our way into the lap of Mother Nature? The answer is very much dependent on the manner by which we conduct our lives, here and now, in the real world. The two states necessarily exist in a dynamic partnership, just as form and spirit interpenetrate each other, and religion and daily life must be one in the same path. Since the ordinary real world is a fact of life for us all, its imperfections and obstacles must be uh, surmounted, often in an inordinately heroic manner, so as to reveal the ideal in the real. The emblem of the method for attaining this ideal state of being is the Great Father as embodied in the guise of the spiritual hero. His archetypal image permeates all art traditions. Sometimes he is seen in close proximity to the cosmic mother image, as in the Paleolithic caves of France and Spain, where rock paintings of the male hunter shaman, charming game animals, and sculptured female Venuses were found, scarcely meters apart. In some other contemporary traditions, such as others that have separated humanity from its divine roots, the goddess is all but absent. There the male principle is artificially inflated by her enforced absence and careens helter-skelter in his fool's paradise of the real world, oblivious to or jealous of any remnants of her ideal reality. Among other surviving traditions, such as the Navajo and Tibetan, male and female spiritual principles continue to coexist, to inform and balance one another, and to enrich the human spirit. In Tibetan and Navajo spirituality, the archetypal male always possesses equipoise, inner balance. He may manifest qualities of character and energies that sometimes appear to be peaceful and other times quite violent, but as an ideal being, his body, speech, and mind are always pure in motivation because they are founded upon universal responsibility, Tibetan, and reasonableness Navajo traits that have compassion at their basis. 
The Navajo and Tibetan idealized male figure is that universal hero with a thousand faces whom Joseph Campbell so eloquently unveiled to the West. Being of our ordinary reality, the real world, the spiritual hero typically sets off on a quest to the realm of the sacred for privileged knowledge, spiritual medicine, and practices for healing psychophysical illness, Navajo, or the psychophysical wisdom and practices leading to enlightenment, Tibetan. As a being of this ordinary reality who must persevere in his quest through a maze of obstacles, usually life and ego threatening, to attain the goal of sacred knowledge, the spiritual hero slash idealized male is in fact both male and female. Human beings, regardless of gender, must take the heroic journey to the ideal state of being. He is, in his or her first aspect, the compassionate warrior. The compassionate warrior. The spiritual warrior dispels the monster demons of the world that impede harmony and natural order. The Navajo have their warrior gods and the Tibetans their warrior kings. Both are born to the Mother Earth persona who had been impregnated by the power of the sky. Warrior divinities are envisaged in a vast number of forms, two or four for the Navajo, and extensive pantheons for the Tibetans. They are called upon in ritual to dispel externally created as well as self-generated obstacles to ordinary life and cosmic balance. For the Navajo, the compassionate warrior is exemplified in the warrior twins, heroic sons of the great goddess Changing Woman. The search for these two-in-one beings, for their father, the sun-bearer, was, uh, was a quest to gain the spiritual empowerment necessary to vanquish the many psychic monsters ravaging their Earth's perfect fifth world.